Hi, this is Frankie Pace. Every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, The Frankie Pace Show brings you the best eclectic interviews done with comedians, singers, actors, playwrights, musicians, producers, directors, and people of all interest. You can also listen to comedy sketches like Ask the Godfather, Herb and Eddie, Gropa from Sesame Place, Huck and Finn, Pothead Lenny, Words of Wisdom by Habib, Talking with Grandpa, and of course, Frankie's Ranch. We're all here on www.thefrankiepayshow.com. My guest tonight is regarded as one of the top in social political humorists in America. He has worked as a stand-up comic, producer, writer, actor, filmmaker, and commentator in several mediums from the early 1980s to the present day. I'm talking about the one and only Jimmy Tingle. How are you, my brother? I'm hanging in there, man. It's uh, it's good to hear from you. And uh, you've been a very busy gentleman, I understand. Yes, we've been working hard, Frankie. You know, you and I, we always keep working. And that's the beauty of this business. And that's also the beauty of the American dream, what my <laughs> film is about. You know, uh-huh. we keep working, keep uh, trying new things. And it's the great one of the great things about the freedom that we have, Frankie Pace. <laughs> <laughs> That's the documentary you're talking about. It's called American Dream. When is that coming out? Jimmy Tingle's American Dream. It's actually airing right now on uh, PBS stations around the country. And I also show it live around the country at different theaters and different shows. So I'm, I'm showing it right now. I'm on Cape Cod and we're showing it every Thursday night down here in Wellfleet, Massachusetts. And uh, tomorrow, this Thursday, we're showing it up in the Upper Cape in Catuit, Massachusetts. And it's a lot of fun. I get to show the film, which is about an hour. It's on the American dream, what it means to me, what it means to other people. Starting out as a stand-up comic, starting my own business as a theater owner, uh, you know, the trials and tribulations of small business, and then, uh, you know, family life and what it means to people. Immigration, we deal with a lot of the issues in the, in, that the country is always grappling with uh, religion, immigration, uh, freedom, civil rights, human rights. Uh, it's a lot of fun, sports, family, and actually going back to school. I actually went back to school, uh, Frankie, a couple of years ago. I went back to the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And I, I got to tell you, Frankie, going from stand-up comedy to the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard was a trip. I have to tell you, <laughs> Well, you went to South- Southeastern Mass first, didn't you? Yes. I went down there in the early 70s, 73. So, uh, yeah, and when I got out of there, I started comedy about two or three years after that. Yeah, but you went into political humor. I'd say that's kind of unique in itself. I mean, most guys just go in for the jokes and try to pick up chicks, and, you know, some guys are doing drugs, some guys are drinking a lot. But you went into political humor. What really sparked you? Was it because you went to the Kennedy School? The, 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 oh, no. No, no, no. I was into it. You know, when I went to uh, undergraduate at, at, at SMU, Southeastern Massachusetts University, which is now UMass Dartmouth, I enjoyed, I always enjoyed sociology classes. I always enjoyed history, political science, those type of courses. I just I identified with them. I grew up in the city. I, I kind of just became easy to me. The subject matter came kind of easy, and I was interested in it. So... When I started performing, you know how it is as a comic. You, you talk about what you care about, right, what right. you're passionate about. And if it's about drinking or trying to pick up chicks, that's in your act. You know? Right, right. But if it's, it's, if it's about other stuff, you know, then people gravitate. If they're, they like sports, they go with that. If they're into relationships, they talk about that. If they're into, you know, sitcoms or television they or movies, they talk about that. Well, I talk, I usually, even from the beginning, had some sort of social and political uh, angle at what I was doing, even though I didn't even know it. I was just talking about what I was interesting to me. 
Uh huh. Uh, what did your parents think, though? I mean, they wanted you probably to become a lawyer or something, or in, probably go into politics. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what they wanted. Or maybe I'm wrong. No. Well, you know, my mother and father, when I first started, um, you know, they were more worried about the drinking. To tell you the truth, <laughs> <laughs> that's what they were more. Oh God! <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. They, they didn't that's they didn't care what I did as a profession. As long as I'm happy, as long as I'm, you know, it's a legal way to make a living. <laughs> when, but I'm, the only thing that my mother was a little nervous about is when I started to, you know, bartend and 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 work in the the Ding Ho, which was the legendary comedy club that a lot of us up here in Boston started in uh, the Chinese restaurant slash comedy club that gave rise to Stephen Wright and Paula Poundstone and Bobby Goldthwait and. I know you had Barry Katz on the show before, had, but Barry remembers that, and yeah. Barry Crimmins, and a lot of great, great comics came out of there. So when I started working there, you know, um, alcoholism was in sort of in the family, so to speak. So there were, and you know, and I had already had a little couple of run-ins, you know, just drinking too much as a, as a in my early twenties. So anyway, that was the only thing that they were afraid of with show business. But the, you know what the reality is, and I know you know this, Frankie, is that. The people who actually make it, you've got to be clear. You've got to be, you've got to be sober. So it's not, even though in the 80s and the 90s there was a lot of that, as we got older and matured and the whole country sort of changed, more people are sober now than they are, than they are drinking. Which That's, is true. Drink. That's true. That's true. You've got to be sharp. You've got to be sharp. You've got to be writing. You've got to be, you know, professional. Because just so your act is great, you want your act to be as good as it can be, but also because of the competition. If right. there's 10 people out there and three of them are hammered and seven of them aren't, the people who aren't hammered are usually going to do better in the long run than the people who are. I knew guys that did smoke and stuff and they became funny on stage, but the, after a while, they, they, they lose that continuity because they have to depend on that. And then when they want to stop doing it, they, they go back to being normal and they're going to start all over again. I mean, it's, you know, the drugs and the booze and it's okay, but it's not the end all. You really have to be yourself, like you say. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that was the only thing. No, my parents, they didn't, I actually did my act for my mother and father. The first time I performed, I did, I did it in the living room well, of my house. <laughs> what was your first line? What would tell you your first lines? God, I used to do songs, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> if you can ask Tony V or Barry Katz. You can ask Barry. I used to dress up in a trench coat. I had a felt hat. I looked like a blues brother. You know, so I was trying to be like the comedian with the blues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poppy and John Belushi and those guys. Uh. So I'd come out and I'd do songs like uh, the Test Two Baby Blues. I'm a <laughs> Test Two Baby. That's why I got the blues. Was a man made mutation scientifically abused. I was the miracle of the laboratory. How come I never made 60 Minutes or even the news? <laughs> Oh, God. And then, then you made your way uh, from uh, the, the clubs in, in Boston with all the guys up there, and you made your way to what, New York City? Is that what you did next? I came down to New York and worked in uh, Katz's Club down there, the Boston Comedy Club. Worked in the Comedy Cellar, Catch Your Eyes and Star, Caroline's, all the regular places, stand up New York, mm -hmm. you know, just like everybody else. And um, you know, just kept doing it and doing it and, and loving it. And, uh, and got sober in 88. And, you know, a friend of mine said, Jimmy, if you ever got sober, you could do really well in comedy. As a matter of fact, Colin Quinn told me that. He said, if you ever quit drinking, you could you could do really, really well in comedy. And I, and I quit drinking, Frankie, and within a year, I did The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Where'd you get your first, your first break? Who saw you, basically? What agent saw you? Jim McCauley. Jim McCauley saw you, and, and he's, what did he see, a catch or? Stand Up New York. Up at Stand Up New York. That was Carrie Hoffman's place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's singing now. He's doing Sinatra. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's, yeah, doing, he's doing great. I heard it's a great show. Yeah, it is a very good. I'm trying to get him on the show here, you know, but... <laughs> oh, doing Sinatra, you got to talk to some people. <laughs> I know Andy Rooney did 60 Minutes, but wasn't there another show that involved you somehow? 60 Minutes 2 on Wednesday night. Ah. And they had all the correspondence, but they didn't have anybody to do the Andy Rooney spot. And I... Basically, saw it in the paper, sent them a tape, and uh, they uh, they loved the tape. And I went down and auditioned, and I got the job. Yeah, I saw you on there a few times. You were very good on there. Thanks, Frank. I did uh, I did two seasons on that, and that was a lot of fun. You know, national television. You know how that is. Yeah, Nas yeah. 
National television is great, but for a comic, it's a little bit, it can be very constricting because there's different parameters. It's not Comedy Central. You know, it's, right. you know, it's, it's what was it, CBS. You, you have the opportunity to take some great shots, but then you're biting your lip and you're going, God, I want to say it, but I can't because I'll lose this job. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, really. And so you got to fit into their format, right? Which I did pretty well, and we did two seasons on it, so that was a that was a fall. Doesn't it? Doesn't it bother you because you're working with people that have no no sense of humor? Basically, they're so stoic, and and you know you're loose, and they're not loose, and they wish they could be like you, and you're, you're kind of hip, and but then again, you have to be like them to be on the show. That's that's the hard part, man. That's that's rough. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's not a comedy show. No, it's not. You know, it should be. A, it's a, serious show and so they want you to be light my, one of my biggest problems on the show was trying to be too, you know maybe too serious you know yeah right now, because you got this great platform and there's all these issues out there in the world and you want to talk about them and try to bring some sort of a, a, a different perspective to it so mm -hmm. that was a, that was challenging but it was a dynamite experience i have to tell you to work with Dan Rather and Mike Wallace and, and, and all those folks. Oh, I thought you were perfect. I thought, my God, this is terrific for Jimmy. This is, they, they zeroed right in on you. I mean, you were perfect for that show. Yeah, well, thank you. I, uh, I, I really enjoyed being on it. And, you know, that's one of the things I'm working on now. All right, what, do you want, what else do you want to do? You know, what other things can you do? Commentaries for other shows or no. whatever. I'm doing a thing right now, a little bit of a, a week in the news thing. And mm -hmm. by the way, Frankie, congratulations to you on this podcast. That's an awesome idea. Thank you very much. I'm I'm trying the best I can. I'm trying to bring as much uh, talent as I can to the to the show. In fact, I've got another interview with a kid named Pete Davidson that I've seen, and I sent him to the uh, to the comic strip, and now he's working with. Um, let me see if I got his name here now. Uh, I don't know if you know this comic, Nick Cannon. I know the name. And uh, he saw this kid, and he took him with him. And I'm so happy because I really believe in my heart that this kid could be the next Dave Chappelle. Really? Yeah. So uh, you know. But uh, getting back to you now, uh, you uh, you did the Larry King show too, didn't you? I was on with Larry. Yep, and that was a lot of fun. I did an off Broadway show in New York uh, in the '90s, and I uh, got on with Larry, and and that was an example where you know some of these issues never go away. I yeah. gotta tell you. And I was on there, and they were just talking about gun control at the time, right? And they were talking about the seven-day waiting period to buy a gun. And I said, Larry, do you believe that the Congress is opposed to a seven-day waiting period to buy a gun? Are Americans in such a hurry to get a gun that they walk into gun stores going, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, I'm an American. Pay my taxes. Uh, an argument. I want a gun. I want it now. <laughs> Hold on, pal. You're going to have to wait a second. You're going to have to fill out a form. You're going to have to wait at least a week for the gun. A week. The guy will be gone in a week. I'm going to shoot him now. <laughs> you know, I was making the point to Larry King, a seven-day waiting period, Larry, to buy a gun, and Congress is against it. Come on, will you, Congress? It takes three weeks to get a phone. Were you comfortable working with Larry? Did you feel intimidated at all? or do you Oh, I felt very comfortable. He, he's he makes you feel at ease. Yeah, he's unassuming, isn't he? He's unassuming. You sit down, and he, he, you know, it was great. It was just great being on with Larry, and it was, um, you know, so it was, it was cool. And that's one of, I mean, the things about this business. You get to meet these people that you've watched for years, like Johnny and Larry, and uh, and and all those folks that you know over the years. I was on with Terry Gross once, and I loved that show on Fresh Air. Mm -hmm. I was on with her once, and that was a. That was a real treat to be on with her because I've listened to that show over the years. And it's, it's very cool, man. And like you said about people coming up who are doing great, there's nothing more exciting than seeing some kid, you know, that you, you saw in a club and all of a sudden in five years they're like hitting it out of the park and in ten years they're superstars, you know. It's, yeah. it's really great. He started at 17 and the, the, he's got a backstory to his father. His father was a fireman in 9-11. In, uh, he was in those towers. Mm. So it's a, kind of an interesting story. I'm going to ask him about it, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to 
push too hard, but I, I, I'm, I'm interested to know about his dad because I, I think uh, any fireman to me is, is a superhero, more so than the police. I mean, these guys don't have anything on them, but just their, their will to save another life, you know. That's so important, and we have to respect those kind of people. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that's going on right now in the world of politics is, you know, a lot of the fire unions and the, and the teachers and the cops, they're all under attack. You know, their unions and their pensions and their health care. In a lot of states, they don't have the money in the cities and towns. And it's a real dilemma because yeah. they're invaluable to the society and to the country. And yet it comes down to dollars and cents, you know? Yeah, everything's dollars and cents. Isn't it disgusting? Well, it's we got to get our priorities right. You know, the show I'm doing now is Jimmy Tingle for President, the funniest campaign in history. <laughs> you know, you know, love I love that. <laughs> the name of my party is Humor for Humanity. <laughs> right, Frankie Pace. I said Humor for Humanity. Humor in helping, humor in healing, humor in hope. Ha, ha, ha. You know, if the whole world left, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have time to hate. They wouldn't have time to hate. That's right. It's so true, man. It really is. You know, I didn't know you were an actor too. You've done you've done a lot of movies. You were in Boondock Saints. You played a priest, and uh, that's right. You were I in did. By the Sea. You did Next Stop Wonderland. You were in Boomtown, uh, Head of State. You're a busy little guy, uh, Jimmy. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I did. I, I played a priest in Boondock Saints. So after this interview, Frankie, if you want me to hear your confession, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> do you miss uh, you miss the guys doing the comedy up at the comedy stop and all those other places? You don't do that anymore, right? I I I pop in from now and now and now and again to do five minutes when I'm practicing my set. So I love seeing everybody. Yeah, I love seeing them. They're so funny. You know, it's a great art form. And you know what else is great, Frankie? There's a ton of new talent coming up because they've seen everybody. You know what I mean? They they have 20 years of history to look at. Yeah. Back to the 80s or 30 years, really. Yeah. Of history. So you got these kids who weren't even, you know, who were born in 80, 80, 85. And now they're doing stand up and they're 21 years old and they're sharp and they're creative and they're funny. And it, it's great to see. Yeah, there they are, but there also are too many comedians, and there also are the ones that don't care. They just come up and waste the, the good the good time that's up there, and uh, that's the the only the only negative thing I have as far as the comedy business. But there are a lot of good bright uh, comedians coming up. Thank God for that. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, I hope I could say God without offending anybody, but thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, tell me about this uh, American Dream documentary. Now, you're, the purpose of this, what do you what do? You do? do you uh, interview other comedians for this? or Who do you interview, the politicians? or? Uh... Oh, no, I got, I got Robert Altman, the director, in there. Oh, that's and interesting. I was in the historian. I got Janine Garofalo. I got Louis Black and Bobby Goldthwait. Yeah. Mort, Mort Saul. Mort Saul. How's he doing? I haven't heard of him in a while. I mean, uh, doing good. he's doing well. What I did, Frank, is I started a theater up in Somerville, Massachusetts. About uh, I started in 2002, so it's like 10 years ago, and I ran it for five years. Mm -hmm. When I had this theater, I had all these different characters coming through all the time. Right. So in 2004, my director said, let's make a movie. I'd like to follow you around. And he goes, you like the American dream. You know, you're starting a theater here and, and where you grew up. So we said, okay, let's do it. So... At the time, the Democratic Convention was in Boston in, in 2004, so we went out with a camera, and that's where we got all these people, Robert Reich and Al Franken, and we got all these, a lot of politicians, and so we met Robert Altman, and Howard Zinn, and Mort Saul had come through the theater, and it was great. And Janine was up there, and Louis Black, and, you know, it was all awesome, Colin Quinn. And so we had all these people, Lenny Clark, so got a little cameo in it. And it was, it was just great what the American dream means to people, you know? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Because for me, like, like, and I'm sure you probably identify with this, you doing your podcast now is like your thing. You know, right. That's like your challenge. That's right. what you're trying to make happen. But 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was trying to get five minutes, get a half an hour, get, a, get an hour, be a, a headliner. You know, there's all different phases of it, right? All right. Of, of what we aspire to do. And that's how it was with me as a, as a comic. And then getting the theater was another phase, trying to make a small business work, you know? Yeah. 
Oh, God. You know, because before I started the theater, Frankie, I was a huge advocate for universal health care for every American citizen. Then I got the theater, and all my employees going, hey, Jim, why don't you start with health care for your own workers first? Huh? <laughs> oh, God. I said, what are we, what are we in Russia? <laughs> Uh, so you're you're ma- happily married. I, I heard your wife in the background when I was talking to you uh, uh, before, and she seems to be the world to you. She is. I call her my trophy wife. Yeah. Right now she's right up here, and she said, and I said trophy wife just as she walked in. <laughs> and yeah, she's great. Her name's Catherine. Uh huh. McDermott Tingle, and we got one son, Seamus. Seamus, and what's he doing? How old is he now? He's fifteen, and he wants to be a rapper. A rapper. Yeah, a rap artist, you know. He comes down for breakfast. <laughs> Last summer, he comes down for breakfast. My wife and I are eating, and he starts talking like gangster rap, you know, like Eminem and all right. these guys. He comes <laughs> down to my wife and I and says, what's up, cracker? Oh, God. <laughs> I said, Seamus, what did I tell you about that? What did I tell you about the language? Yo, 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 what's up, Dad? Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> what's up, cracker? I said, what did I tell you about that language? Pronounce your R's. Cracker. <laughs> Cracker. Your mother and I are crackers. <laughs> well, you, you sound like you got everything going pretty well with yourself, and you're happy, and you're enjoying yourself. That's all that counts. I mean, life goes very fast. Don't the seasons seem to get faster and faster? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, when you were eight years old, the summer was about ten years. It right. Took, it took a year for the summer to get over when you are a little kid. Yeah. Oh, it's like Fourth of July, Labor Day. We're, we're back in school. What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is, Frankie. We're I, lucky, you know. We've been able to make a living all these years. Yeah. Just with doing what we love to do, and it's a, it's a, it's a great gift. And people like you have always made the comedy scene a dynamite place to work, and I, I cherish your friendship, and I thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Well, brother. I really appreciate having you on here, and, and I think you're a talented guy, and uh, I'm, I wish you a lot of luck with this documentary. I hope it takes off, and I hope it's bigger than ever. Thank you. I'm the Michael Moore of Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Go get him, big guy. J- Jimmy, thanks again, and uh, take care, and uh, come back anytime, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Hey, Frankie, could, could I give my website now? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do that. Yeah. Uh, if anybody's interested in Jimmy Tingle for president or my film, Jimmy Tingle's American Dream, you come to the website, jimmytingle.com. You can like us on Facebook, or you can follow me on Twitter. And I just have to say, Frankie, just like all the other presidential candidates, I have no idea how any of this stuff works, okay? <laughs> all I know is I got a tweet three weeks ago from a kid named Josh. He said, Jimmy, this is Josh. I'm following you. <laughs> and I just want to say, Josh, if you're listening to this podcast, you're creeping me out. <laughs> Jimmy Tingle for president, ladies and gentlemen. The one and only Jimmy Tingle. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jimmy. You're a great Thank guy. You, Take care of yourself, yeah. huh? That's Jimmy Tingle, terrific guy. You'll love him. Check out his documentary, American Dream. I'm Frankie Pace. This is the Frankie Pace Show. We'll be right back.